Hank Green's first book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing, was released in 2018. The story of a young woman thrown into and then growing her fame as the world suddenly has to deal with massive changes in the form of contagious dreams and mysterious 10 foot tall robots that have appeared in every major city. The Associated Press said it was a thrilling journey that takes a hard look at the power of fame and our willingness to separate a person from the brand. Book Reported said it was, quote, perhaps as honest a look as we will ever get into the phenomenon of cyber fame. And the San Francisco Chronicle said, quote, sparkling with mystery, humor, and the uncanny, this is a fun read, but beneath its effervescent tone, more complex themes are at play. Well, now that novel is out in paperback or at your library and also for cheap in audio form. And the sequel and conclusion of the story, A Beautiful Foolish Endeavor, is out to sparkling reviews. Hank wanted his publisher to sponsor a ton of small podcasts, but they said it was too weird. So instead, Hank took 5% of his advance from the book and did it himself. Library Journal's starred review said, Throughout this adventurous, witty, and compelling novel, Green delivers sharp social commentary on the power of social media and both the benefits and horrendous consequences that follow when we give too much of ourselves to technology. The book is out July 7th in physical, audio, and ebook wherever books are sold. Or you can just go to hankgreen.com and that will get you where you need to go. Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half-Blood, a Percy Jackson read-along podcast. I'm B, And I'm Zach. And this week we read chapters 16 and 17 of The Lost Hero. Yes, we did. This is uh, two short chapters again. Like I'm seeing a pattern now. The first two were like super duper long, like the first half before the quest. And everything is like one very short chapter, one really long chapter. And I'm like, I like that. Well, I feel like because there's a lot of like retreading of... Not exactly like scene for scene, the same stuff that's happening. They're not always like temporarily happening exactly at the same time, but there's a lot of like overlap. So it's not really necessary to kind of like reiterate it, especially now that all of our characters are together in one place, as opposed to like a sort of split screen of them off doing their own thing in camp. So it's kind of redundant to harp too much on what's happening. Well, especially now we're going to be having at the end of like these chapters, we have Leo branching off into his own path. We're going to be having more of like those branch narratives where like we have a couple people going on this little quest while the other person's staying back or, you know, vice versa in that way. Right. Well, yeah, like in this case, like which we'll get into, like, for instance, they'll make Leo stay behind. So then obviously that makes the two Piper and Jason separated from him. So there, there's obviously still ways for them to like have their own stuff going on, I guess. But um, for the most part, their their narratives are a little bit more converged again now that they're not at camp. That was like one of the biggest concerns for me when I first started reading A Song of Ice and Fire because that first book is so like everyone's kind of together. So like when they did different POV shots, it was just like, but the person that we just went was like in the d- next door over. But as that series went along and like people started to spread out to different parts of the continent and all that stuff, the POV works better here. I like that they're kind of going for this because the problem, though, is like just imagine having like POV switches while they're on the dragon like and Piper sat in the back. Yeah. And then then Piper was on the dragon and thinking, this. yeah, that's kind of what they did. Right. Because there's they have the perspective of of Piper, like having like her weird feels about Jason on the dragon and the perspective of Leo having his weird feels about his fire powers on the dragon and his mom dying. And Jason's just like, I wish I knew if I had problems to begin with. (laughs) And yeah, Jason's like, I wish I could be angsty, but I can't remember anything. So B, what is the name of the section of these chapters? What's the name? I'm curious. Gibby, Gibby. Okay, so I went with another punny one, which is uh, Leo gets an icy welcome. (laughs) Ooh, that one's that one's a good one. Yeah, oh, man. I think the one that I was thinking of, the one that I thought of was meet Festus, the portable dragon. Yeah, that's true. He does fold up. Yeah, yeah. He's a, what, is it like Transformers robots in disguise? I guess. Exactly. Except it turns into the businessman stuff. I mean, it would be so cool if he was like a Dinobot or like 
Starscream and the gay romance between him and Megatron. I love that romance so much. Yeah, um, it was kind of uh, fun to get more info on Festus and how he works. I, I mean, they're just obviously building towards something where he's going to malfunction because there's like some pretty obvious um, foreshadowing about how his like ear is leaking oil and is like sparking and then leo's like yeah i kind of did my best like cleaning his brain but like it might be bad we'll find out it's really like chekhov's inhibitor chip because he kind of talks about hopefully it doesn't break i tried to look for another one but this is the only one of its kind and the way that they're foreshadowing it even like using festus's like imperfections to their advantage from not being blown up out of the sky like we're on this malfunctioning dragon. I mean, we could fall any second now into Quebec and kill a bunch of Canadians. It's kind of interesting. I did the only thing I think of note in like this first chapter is that there's a lot of like trading of information, but it's like very tentative specific information, right? Like we know that the characters are withholding some things. I mean, not Jason obviously because he doesn't know what to withhold. <laughs> Well, he hasn't mentioned the thing about Talia yet, um, I guess. Well, no, because out of everyone, he's the one that kind of is withholding the information. Even Leo kind of started talking about some stuff. Obviously, he also left some things out. Right. No, that's what's interesting is they're like sort of comparing notes, but like in this very like loosey goosey of... type of way. It's like white lies. Yeah, like lie of omission kind of way where they're like not telling the whole truth like piper obviously is like talking about some things she knows about the giants and how she like had read things about mythology with her dad she doesn't mention that she'd been having this dream or that her dad is captured or any of that stuff and then leo sort of hints at you know he knew hera via his aunt who was really hera all this time and like sort of tells the story of his mom's death but like not fully and doesn't mention anything about the fire powers it's like dude do you think it's gonna be helpful for you to hold this back from the people you're traveling with like you're, it's gonna come to light yeah no it's definitely like what you would call like a politician's lie where pretty much like they're telling kind of the truth but they're leaving important details out of the entire narrative i mean there's sometimes parts where he like straight up lies which we'll get into well, no there's um, the part like he's like talking to himself and then he accidentally speaks out loud to everyone like what what happened oh i was just uh Real nervous and anxious. I didn't sleep that much last night. I attached yeah, these wings. I am hallucinating, to, uh, which is like somehow yeah, he's better. Like hallucinating. Um, but even in like the next chapter, when they're like, "Oh no, no, he's not like one of those like fire guys who can, ha you know, use fire." That you're misunderstanding. And then he just sort of makes this like sort of nervous reaction, like, "Uh, yeah, sure." Like, can't really confirm or deny. If I wanted to give, like, the summary for, like, the first chapter, it's more like they're flying to Quebec, and basically they get to Quebec. There's not really much, like, you could give other than they kind of have, like, the method of, like, them flying through the air. I like, again, I think dragons are cool in this narrative. I like that, again, we're going into more, like, fantastical elements, and for me, there's nothing more cooler than, like, you know, kids flying on dragons, because for me, as a person that grew up, like, just reading... Like, the Dragon Riders of Pern. Uh, any book that I like a dragon on, I would pretty much just devour. Though, again, didn't necessarily like Aragon. I feel like that's like a certain subsection of children who just were like, that's a dragon. I will read that book about the dragon. I'd call them different fiefdoms of kids. There was the dinosaur kid. There was the dragon kid. Horse girl. Egyptian kid. Um, horror kid. My cousin was a dinosaur kid, 100%. My cousin thought he was a dinosaur like or i don't know okay maybe that's a, a hair too far he like insisted that he was a, a dinosaur or like was very immersed in the the fiction that he was and would like make dinosaur noises and i remember it was my fifth birthday party so he was probably like a little bit older like seven or something and he like refused to talk to us because he just would roar and he would like eat leaves and stuff and climb trees. And like, I remember my sister crying and being like, Michael, you're ruining my birthday with your dinosaur. And I don't like. <laughs> but you've never told me this story. And the more you tell it to me, I'm loving it every second. And I was about to say it was his name. Michael is my human name. My dinosaur name is Velocirion. No, he didn't like say anything. That's that the, he just roared like a dinosaur because he this is what happens when you're like born around the time of Jurassic Park being released and it just becomes your personality for like the first seven years of your life. And then he grew up to be an emo kid and go roar. That means I love you and dinosaur. <laughs> 
imagine. No, they, he really went the opposite direction there. Anyway, we're getting a little bit off topic, but um, yeah, the, I like the dragon character. Um, Festus is kind of interesting because it's like he seems friendly and he kind of has like that personality of like a sort of like friendly animal companion, but you just know that something's going to go wrong. Like he's sort of a ticking time bomb when it comes to like his malfunctioning like innards. I guess. I don't know. He has like the problem with the with the brain chip and then also he's just like might just collapse and fall out of the sky. So it's probably not going to be great um, when that happens. See, that's like normally like the trope, isn't it? Like when you have like a person befriending an animal, it turns out actually a good example of this. I'm going to use a movie example is the Iron Giant. Like, oh, you have like the big friendly thing that turns out to be a gigantic deadly monster that could kill you at any second. Right. Like, yeah, it's friendliness is like contingent on like a malfunction sort of. And like if, it might just like snap out of it and its eyes will turn red and all of a sudden it's a murder bot, basically. I think, yeah, we're just kind of waiting for that to happen. That's very much a trope when it comes to like child's fantasy stories or like uh, people befriending animals that are supposed to be like misunderstood in many other ways. Yeah, he's both the robot trope and the animal. He's like both at the same time. And yeah, he's just basically a taking time bomb. Like we don't really know when it's going to happen, but it might. I mean, that's basically like the uh excuse that they use when they get to montreal about like oh well it's an emergency landing because festus is about to blow like any and it's like it's believable because it's a very well there's even the part like he like turns his head and like like gunk comes out of it yeah like oil comes out like exactly so like they kind it's like again that's not exactly a lie either they're sort of (laughs) maybe exaggerating the truth but the cool thing about that though b is it's like it almost like festus kind of emulates like uh, Leo's personality in that way they're both kind of like kind of put together in this way like they're given to their circumstances like they're very much like I, I guess for I guess metaphors for each other in that way where like they're both misunderstood they both have like issues and problems but that's not what defines them it's like their lovability oh I was gonna say that they're similar in that they're like that meme where the car is like a centimeter away from the wall and she's like this is how cl- close I am to losing it like that's <laughs> Both Festus and Leo, and that's what they have in common. Before we end, like, this chapter, one thing I wanted to talk about was kind of, like, how Leo kind of breaks down the entire plan in, like, a couple sentences, and I think it's so hilarious. Leo whistled, so giants can throw mountains, friendly wolves that will eat us yeah. if we show them weakness, evil espresso drinks, gotcha. Maybe this isn't the time to bring up my psycho babysitter. Yeah, I kind of wasn't expecting him to because of everything else. He's like, oh, and Leo withheld this because it seemed like a lot. But it's sort of, I was surprised with how much they did share. Like, I thought, like, they were all just going to be like, oh, like, uh, but I guess if you're traveling on a dragon, like, on the same quest, you have to, like, sort of share some information or else it's suspicious if they're all just, like, sitting there in silence. Well, I mean, you're flying from, like, New York to Quebec. You kind of have, like, a while to actually just sit there. And I think you're not going to talk about, like, the baseball game. Yeah, I've done that traveling, and it takes a little while. I mean, I'm sure Dragon is faster than Train, but I have done that trip before. (laughs) I have not. I've only gone to Canada, like, twice in my life, and both times were very long plane rides. Though, what I wanted to like to say about this is, like, I kind of like that they're kind of adding this new element where, like, when Leo gets too excited, like, he'll accidentally have, like, his internal monologue turns into, like, external monologues. At times, he accidentally spills things out and they think it's a joke. Yeah, I I guess he, I mean, he did that that one time. I, I'd be interested to see if that happens again, where he just, like, blurts out that he has fire powers. It's interesting, like, how sometimes it seems like he's very bad at lying, and other times it's like, oh, he's kind of concealing a lot about his past. Like, even the thing about his, like, mom's death and stuff, like, he was hiding a lot of that uh, for a long time. And when he tells them, he, it even says, like, oh, he feels like it, it's easier to, like, sort of lie to them because he's facing forward, like, steering Festus so he can't like doesn't have to look them in the face and is like telling this half truth about how like oh yeah the shop collapsed but he doesn't say why and he doesn't say it was on fire like there's very specific details he leaves out I again I just feel very strange about why he would lie about the firepower things I don't think it's like any more like sort of damning towards him than like any other thing he's shared with them so it just it seems like an interesting thing to leave out well, here's the thing as well is like when he accidentally blurts it out, they think that he's joking because, again, his personality is so fitted around just being the jokey person that they don't take him seriously. And I kind of like that he has to like backtrack a little bit yeah. and kind of have to spill the beans just a bit. Like he doesn't explain his fire powers, but he explains how his mom died and kind of like this weird, like earthy looking woman coming after him. And obviously like Hera in those regards. And I think 
what I like about Leo in this regard is that like out of everybody, he's the one like he'll slip up the most. That's like a very natural thing. Like there's times where like when you're upset or something, you start talking to yourself and you're saying like the most random things. I know it's happened to me before where like I'm looking for something and like you kind of the only way to actually get it out is by saying it like in person. And I like that they have that with Leo compared to like Percy Jackson never does that. Piper doesn't do that. Jason never does that. It's a specific Leo thing. Yeah, it's a Leo yeah, thing. I, they sort of go into like why he doesn't share that, that like if he mentions his mom's death, that or like if he goes into why she died with the fire, then he'll have to mention the fire powers. And then he's sort of complicit, even though it's like really not his fault. But like I guess it's I guess he has this like weird survivor's guilt thing. And that's why he's not sharing. Like, I understand why Piper lies, right? Because she has, like, a, a vested interest in, like, staying this double agent or whatever she's acting as right now because she has to save her dad. So that's, like, her whole mission is to be, like, this sort of duplicitous person so that way she can save her dad and, like, be actually working for nefarious reasons but like there's kind of no reason leo needs to lie like he sort of like emotionally feels guilty but like it's not like he actually did anything bad necessarily also in this regard it actually brings up another interesting point which is that both leo and jason have never seen one of her dad's movies so they have like this weird common ground where like they aren't looking at her like, oh, this child of like Tristan McLean, but they're looking at her as just Piper. Right, that's true. Yeah, I mean, Leo kind of knows a little bit. Like, he's just like, oh, yeah, her dad is an actor. And then Jason is kind of oblivious where he's like, oh, yeah, he does. Well, I mean, Bl Jason has amnesia, so like he doesn't, who, who knows what actors he remembers? Like, imagine he doesn't know his name, but he remembers who like Chris Pratt is or whatever. Like, he would not know... <laughs> You know what I mean? Like why I sometimes I can't remember the names of actors. Never mind Jason who can't remember like his own. He just remembered his own last name like a couple chapters ago. So like we're, you know, do they like fly over something? Oh, look, that reminds me of the movie with Kirk Douglas in it. Wait, you remember Kirk Douglas, but you can't remember <laughs> your own name. Nope, not really. Yeah. <laughs> Like, um, that's a silly thing that would be funny to do. Yeah, I, I have the entire IMDb just committed to memory, but as for my identity, not so much. I mean, again, that's like an intentional obfuscation on this whole... There's a reason he's missing his memory. It's an intentional thing, but... Jason's like, the only thing that I can remember about me is my name, uh, the, now that I have a sister, and also the complete cast list of the original Broadway recording for Cats. For some good reason. <laughs> it's not very helpful, but it is in there. You know it will um, probably become helpful at one point when there's the one guy that's really obsessed with cats. Uh, you know, it's Zeus. It has to be Zeus. I, I don't know if I know a single person who was in the original Cats, actually. I don't know anybody that was in that. No. Uh -oh. I was I was just going to name Mandy Patinkin, but that's just because the, that's the only musical theater actor that came to mind, but I'm pretty sure he was not in Cats. It'd be funny if he was, but I don't think he was. You have a 1% chance of that actually being possible. It isn't zero because in an alternate reality, that could have happened. It's true. It's it's Actually, the listen, only person that was supposed to be in the original Cats. You know, Dame Judi Dench, right? Yeah, it was going to be Judi Dench. <laughs> and then she was like, I'll, I'll do, I'll be Deuteronomy. And it's like, why? why? You, don't, you don't need to do this, Judy. You can stay home. You don't, you have money. The only reason why she wasn't in the original Cats was because she actually, I think, broke her leg or something. And that's what kept her from being in Cats the first time. This is this is my redemption. This is what they'll remember me for. Yeah, she was spared by fate, and then she decided... Anyway, we're getting into Cats. And then she went into Artemis Fowl, and I think that's such a better performance. <laughs> uh. Okay, moving on to this uh, second chapter, when we go to the summary when it comes to this, is uh, pretty much... Oh, I forgot one thing, B. What? Leo falls asleep, and nothing happens. Yeah, that's true. I was, true. like, shocked. Oh, yeah, there's no vision or anything. He just, he falls asleep for, like, a second, and then he wakes up, and they're in Montreal. That's true. I guess they kind of use his sleeping less as, like, an intro to a chapter a wherein they'll be, like, a, exactly. It's not going to be, like, a vision or a dream, and instead is just, like, a fade to black that then when he wakes up, it's, like, it skips time, because otherwise it's, like, are we just going to describe this very long flight? to montreal like this is kind of boring i would be so bored because there's no ipads there's no ability to read a book because you're like strapped to the dragon without any seat belts and you're just like ah, ah. especially just imagine if like thalia was there she'd just be catatonic because she couldn't look down or up or anywhere right because she's afraid of heights but yeah jason isn't afraid of heights like i love heights heights are good 
heights that's are true yeah he doesn't have the ironic fear of heights no he doesn't so um so yeah like- i guess the the main the meat of these two chapters is in chapter 17 when they finally get to montreal because they need to meet uh the north wind yes so kind of what happens with this chapter is they make it to quebec the beautiful old north american city like one of the oldest from 16 something something and what happens is they're looking for Boris, the god of the wind, but they end up meeting uh, two people that look like they're from Hall and Oates, and bad things start to happen. Yeah, well, well, one guy looks like a sort of 70s, sort of slimy guy. Like, I don't know, like a real, like, lounge lizard gross man, but he's like a teenager, And then one is like a sort of bruiser hockey player. So these are uh, Zeeth, I want to say. Let's go with Zeeth and Cal. Cal is short for something that I can't remember now. (laughs) It's some full name. Do you want me to read the description for these two? Because it's hilarious. Yeah, go for it. One was the size of an ox with a bright red hockey jersey, baggy sweatpants, black leather cleats. And the guy clearly had been to too many fights. And when he bared his teeth, several of them were missing. The other guy looked like he just stepped off one of Leo's mom's 1980s rock album covers, Journey, maybe or Hollow Notes, or something even lame. His ice white hair was long and feathered into a mullet. Ugh. He wore pony toed leather shoes, d- uh, designer pants that were way too tight, and god awful silk shirt with the top three buttons open. Maybe he thought he looked like a groovy love god, but the guy could have weighed more than 90 pounds and he had a Bad case of acne. I like that they have like these godly people and they're like really, really, really tacky. Well, they're like weird yeah. teens because like I guess we find out a little bit of the backstory of them is that they used to be demigods, but I guess we'll get into it. They, they sort of look like angels and when they see them from a distance, when they arrive at Montreal, they think they're maybe storm spirits and they're like, ah, these guys again. Evil Bendies, espresso yeah, as, machines. Uh, as Leo said, evil, yeah, evil espresso drinks. So I, I think I, I'm with Leo in calling them storm spirits because I feel like venti is like I just keep thinking of the drink and it's or like the drink size. Yeah, we, that was the first joke I think I wrote for this entire thing. Like, like the coffee. Yeah, like a twenty ounce coffee. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, that, and it's it's weird that you you think about these people like when you think of like angels, you think of them being super angelic. But then you see these people like uh, maybe. Maybe our idea of what angelic is is wrong completely. This is maybe the right interpretation of what we think of like when we see an angel. Yeah, that or a bunch of eyes floating on a wheel. Um, and we discover, of course, that they uh, are specifically the children of Boreas, which is um, the north wind whomst they are looking for. Uh, when they arrive in Quebec, they see this big castle. Piper seems to know something about Quebec where she says something to the effect of like, oh, it's like one of the oldest um, like cities in North America. And uh, she actually knows something about the weird castle in the center, which is actually a hotel. And then Leo thinks that she's pulling his leg, but that's true. It is a hotel and that's where Boreas seems to be say- staying. When they get closer, this is when they meet the weird angel people who are actually, they have like a name to them, but it sounds like Boreas, but it's like something else. Borlosians, um, I think. I'd have to like look it up. Yeah, but but basically they hear that and they go, wait a second, that sounds like you're related to Boreas, and then they're technically, I mean... B, they're called Boreads? Yeah, Boreads maybe? Boreads, I want to say? Something like that. Um, And they're like, oh, do you mean like sons of Boreas? Um, Technically, they're not really his sons, because they're demigods, right? So like, are they... Are they demigods in the sense that they actually are his children or like they're just dedicated to him? Yes, yes, they are. Because they talk about how they hung out with the original Jason and that they transcended to like immortality to help their daddy. Right, because they were demigods. So I guess they're they're demigods in the sense that they're they're like minor demigods because their dad is Boreas and then they dedicated themselves to him in exchange for like this immortality, which yikes, because like the to choose to look like that forever um, is maybe not the most flattering. 
In my eyes, I think what Rick Rogers trying to say is that people from Canada are like stuck in the eighties still. Like they have like that hoser accent, <laughs> right? Almost like I think it's like they're supposed to be tacky. Yeah, so like they still look like teenagers. No, everyone like looks like Napoleon Dynamite. Like apparently, yeah, Zeke especially. It sounds like um because he also has like this kind of horrible like French accent that, according to Leo, is like maybe fake. Like that's how bad it sounds, and he's kind of creepy. He's a creepo, and he keeps hitting on Piper, and of course she still has the quote-unquote gift of Aphrodite, um, wherein she looks beauteous, and she doesn't want to look that way because she's on a quest and wants people to take her seriously, and she's like getting hit on by this gross French spirit guy. Is it because he's French? It's supposed to be, ah, uh, French is the language of, of romance. Yeah, I don't know. He's, like, hitting on her the whole time, basically. Um, that, so- that sort of works to their advantage, in a way, because, again, they arrive, and they're like, you can't be here, you don't have air clearance, and they kind of seem suspicious about the whole thing, and that you need to, like, arrange an appointment to see their dad, and they're, like, I guess his guardians. They're sort of protecting him by hanging out near the hotel where he lives. Yeah, no, like, they're trying to, like, protect him in that way, like, that's kind of like their job. That's one of the reasons why they are immortal. But also at the same time, what I find hilarious about this whole situation is they're all hovering upon like a metropolitan city just as a dragon and these two angels. You have like this weird situational comedy almost where like they're just like hovering and they don't know what to do. Like you don't have hair clearance. And Leo's like, uh, please, can we come down? And it has to be like Piper. It's like, okay, I'm gonna have to use my ability, even though she doesn't want to, to kind of like woo them into giving them air clearance in this weird way of like, Tricking them because the cool thing that um, Rick Ryden kind of does here is like he already shoots down one stereotype about Aphrodite is that Piper's really, really smart. And she even says like not all kids of Aphrodite are not airheads. Right, exactly. She's like, yeah, just because I'm child of Aphrodite, right, that she doesn't read or whatever. Like, yeah, she seems to be, she's still sort of- She's breaking um, the mold of what we think of when we think of Aphrodite. Yeah, which is kind of interesting that she actually reminds me a lot of Annabeth and that she is like pretty well- um research in this kind of stuff like knows a good amount about mythology and like about like history um but that doesn't have anything to do with her godly parent necessarily she's just like a bright kid who you know has read these things separately i've kind of always been under the notion of like when it comes to, like this weird stereotype of like aphrodite kids it's like well there's like that thing where like it's always like the characteristics i'd give like an example of like the evil queen and like snow white or like mm-hmm. any other person that's like super beautiful but they're also like very cunning and like really 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 smart not to say that like being evil means that you have to be beautiful and like that stuff that i'm saying right is, like, no yeah but it like they don't necessarily are they're not necessarily mutually mutually exclusive because yeah in some ways like she kind of has to have a certain cleverness to her because her persuasiveness is her cleverness like she's able to get out of situations yeah so um she kind of demonstrates that i like that a lot that you sort of get a little bit of like a multifaceted view of her it's like yeah she's beautiful but she's also smart she can be both um it'd be so annoying if she was just like that like air heady type of person that like stumbles between one situation to the other because that's not like a good type of situation which you're giving when you're like you're a teenager like you don't want to have like that oh because you know she's pretty she's like an airhead i like that what rick Ryden does with piper in this way is that She's very smart. She's very competent. And she doesn't want to be pretty. Like, that's just, unfortunately, that's part of who she is. But it isn't something that defines her. Yeah, I really like that. I, like, like I said, like, our, dem- like, our sort of baseline of what Children of Aphrodite were was, like, Selena, who I guess until the last book, she was kind of, a, like, a butt of a joke where she was, like, the sort of ditzy girl who didn't really... You know, who was, like, very love-struck and, like, didn't really care about important things in the way that, like, that's a stereotype. And to some extent, that's kind of still the way that they demonstrate that with characters like Drew. But I think Piper is, like, pretty multifaceted, which is nice. Um, And she defends herself against, you know, um, Leo, who's a little bit like, hey, what now? You know words and things? I think one of the issues when it comes to Percy Jackson is the first couple books, if you, like, really look at them... A lot of those campers are such, like, non-characters. Like, they're more, like, there to be conflicts for Percy. Like, we have, like... I guess the only one that would be the example that's good is, like, Clarice. Like, she's more fully fleshed out. But, like, you have Beckendorf. You have Selena. Like, they aren't... They're, like, non-characters until the story makes them non-characters. Like, they actually become... You know, they have a purpose. And that's when we kind of try to fall in love with them. But there was never the groundwork to begin with where, like, Percy befriended these people and you actually spent, like, 
paragraphs learning about them. It's more like, okay, they're just here as funny goofs, and then Percy goes on his quest. Right, they're, they're like, not multifaceted because they're, like, background characters. I see what you're saying. It, I was going to say, for a quote-unquote Leo chapter, I do think that this actually focuses a lot on a lot of different characters. Like, we get a little bit of, like, insight about how Piper's feeling. We get a little bit of insight about, like, Jason and how, like, he's kind of important to this because he's the one who is, like, beckoned um, by, uh, who is, what is her name? The the girl who shows up. Callan Zeeth's daughter. Yeah, whatever. Or, yeah, Callan Zeeth's sister, so it's Boreas's daughter. Um, she shows up. A uh, Borentina? Yeah, whatever her name is. This girl. Um, uh, the scary, You know what, it's probably lady. gonna be something like Aurora or something, like the Aurora yeah, Borealis. Probably. Oh, see, look. There, oh my god, I just realized something. Is the Aurora Borealis named after the Wind God? Yeah, maybe. And well, Boreas probably means something about the sky, and then Ar- Aurora means probably. I think Aurora means light, so I think Aurora Borealis just means literally light in the sky. <laughs> From what I under light in the northern sky. Hold on, let me like. J- I want to look up what that means. Yeah, Borea- Borealis is northern. And Aurora is the Roman go- goddess of the dawn, so it's the northern dawn. So yeah, Borealis means northern, which makes sense that Boreas would be the north wind. Well, it also makes sense because when you get more north into Canada, that's when you actually see the Aurora Borealis. That or it's in the uh, it's in Springfield with steam hams. <laughs> at at this time, in this year, and this year in the located okay, centrally in your kitchen, can I see it? No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. can you believe that was a meme at one point <laughs> i don't know why it's funny it's great it's i hilarious. think steamed hams is a hilarious meme i continue to find it hilarious anyway um yeah so there's like actually kind of a lot of interesting things going on with all the characters there i mean like even though it's like a leo chapter interestingly enough leo is kind of excluded in this right because they they finally persuade themselves to like get entrance into this hotel where Boreas is hanging out. That's like kind of what's fascinating about this chapter is it's not a fight scene or anything. It's which I thought it would be. Like there's very palpable tension that any second it could be a fight scene, right? Like there's Jason holding his coin. Any second they're like they, you know, uh Festus wants to breathe fire on them. You think that it's about to turn into a fight scene. And like instead of that happening, it's just this endless like sort of ne- like negotiation where they're like, no, are you sure? And then, like, there's Piper who, like, uses her, like, Aphrodite charm to, like, get uh, Zeeth to, like, think that she's flirting back at him. And I don't know. It's it's kind of more interesting than a fight scene. I was, I'm really glad that they avoided that because it made it kind of more fascinating. I've noticed that be actually with this whole new series is that there's a lot less fight scenes. Like, the first fight scene, real fight scene that we get is in the first chapter because there's no choice. I like that. I like that Rick Ryden's kind of doing here is he's not, you know, not all problems can be solved with just hitting a sword, but they can be solved through just talking in diplomacy again. Yeah. Like diplomacy actually is a really good thing. I wish more people would kind of do like talking things out with those issues. And I like that when it comes to them, all their solutions are always very clever because we're looking at, you know, Festus, who's like sparking and stuff. They're using that to their advantage of like, okay, we're going to fall out any second now. And they kind of like pretty much like, strong arm them into like making them set down because like well we don't know if this dragon's gonna fall apart even though we know as the audience it probably won't fall apart and when they do land it becomes more clever because they're gonna keep playing on it even though like they could easily have solved this issue with the sword but again as we saw with the venti if you hit them with a sword they might not be hurt because they're a part of the wind almost like it might go right through them yeah they're transparent i guess i like that and i like that like once we get more into like when it comes to like fastest and stuff, I like how they're eliminating some of the problems that some of the readers might have where like Leo hits a switch and it like turns into a briefcase. And I think that's adorable to me. Yeah, that, like there's fun problem solving. Yeah, I just I'm I've talked about this like a billion times on our show that I, like, yeah, fight scenes are meh. Not just in this series or like Rick Riordan books, like just in general, action isn't like really the genre I tend to gravitate towards. I don't find fight scenes usually very compelling because it's just like really just describing physical like, you know, choreography, like fight choreography, which like is that that's not super engaging to me. 
because I feel like in a visual medium, it's like different, but like reading it on in text, I'm like, I, I'm not super wrapped by this. But like, you know, dialogue is so much more interesting because like the, I feel like it's so much more tense and engaging to see them avoid fighting as opposed to just go for fighting. And then you have to describe that. Instead, it's like this weird back and forth of like, oh, well, y- this like Cal who is, you know, basically has air for brains, like doesn't even know how to string three words together and he has like this one track mind of wanting to kill them and he keeps being like kill them destroy them and you're just ready for that to happen that he's gonna kill them and instead it's like you know piper using her charm to do so them coming up with this excuse about festus like malfunctioning and that they need to make an emergency landing then cal getting really disappointed that he can't kill them because it's his like favorite thing to do and there's just like this tension of them constantly like almost on the verge of fighting and they're like they don't seem happy that they're there and they're like okay who are you explain who you are then leo mentions that he's a child of hephaestus and once he like packs up festus into the briefcase then they realize like you smell like fire no it wasn't the dragon it was you and then like his weird secret about you know the fact that he has fire powers is being hidden like all of this wouldn't have come to the fore if they were just like slap dashing, you know, trying to stab each other with swords. Like it, it's so much more interesting. Well, for me, the way that I'm looking at this is also like through the juxtaposition of like Percy, whereas near the ending of like the last Olympian, all of his problems are dealt with with like physical violence, whereas they're not talked out. And when it comes to like fight scenes, I agree with you. I think it has to do with more with like the author's like spatial awareness. I've actually uh, during quarantine, I've been reading The Wheel of Time, and I think. Those are probably some of the most well-written fight scenes. The reason why, once I found out that uh, Robert Jordan, the guy that wrote Wheel of Time, uh, he was a soldier, he was a Vietnam vet, so it makes sense, like, oh, he's seen combat, so he understands, mm. like, how to write a combat scene, because most people are like, oh, you, you know, parry, parry, fight, fight, but it's more like, the most interesting parts about those series is, like, when people are getting into a sword fight, it isn't about the actions, but it's about people like, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap, I'm being, I'm being stabbed, what do I do in the situation, more as, like, it's both a mixture of like physicality, but also like internal conflict, which I think Rick Riordan could do in this. But I like how he's going again for diplomacy, which I think is a much better alternative. Because again, as teenagers, you don't, you know, a lot of teenagers like they take out their anger in much different ways, usually through physicality or like, you know, doing active sports or like punching walls like Kyle does. And it's like they're also have magical power. So it's like, is it that impressive that they are using a sword or whatever? I mean, in, in some ways, like, having Piper as a character really introduces the possibility of not having a bunch of fight scenes because she's not like a fighter necessarily, right? Like her whole power is persuasiveness. I also think the other thing that as well as this is that all three of them are as green as grass. Well, I mean, obviously like out of all of them, Jason has the most experience, but he can't remember anything and he's done it by pure instinct. But both Piper and Leo have never gone on a quest. They have they actually don't have the training sequence where they go on a training mission. They pretty much just go on the quest. Even Percy had like a, a couple days of training before he went on the Lightning Thief uh, quest line. But here it's a little different because they have to go with like super duper sneaky. Like it's like a like Metal Gear Solid where like the whole point of that game is to be super sneaky, not go in guns a blazing. And when you're dealing with these gods, again, they have the timeline of three days. They can't just stop and they have to pick their fights wisely, which I like here is that we get it through like this such a comedic solution that when it actually has like it actually has like a really good payoff to it because again they're using every part of like obviously the bronze dragon to like help them out and then we're gonna see what's gonna be happening next because even when they get to the part where like when Leo turns Festus into like the briefcase like you smell like fire and it's like guys uh could you help me with this like he doesn't know how to like articulate like uh no I don't I don't shoot fire ha 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 that's some hot headed thinking you guys got there. Ha ha ha. Like, there's things like that, which I like about Rick Riding when it comes to this series. Is there's more problem solving rather than, I'm going to hit thing with sword and we win. Yeah. So, anywho, um, they get very close to fighting, but they do not. Um, and then it's kind of funny because this is a Leo chapter, but Leo is the one who's like sort of most ostracized when he comes here. Makes sense. It is an ice palace, right? So they like arrive at this hotel and it's like sort of like a normal hotel room, very opulent, but everything's coated in a thin sheet of ice. Makes sense. It's the North Wind. He's cold, I guess. (laughs) But yeah, they're not super thrilled to have him around, obviously, because he has fire powers and they can tell and like, you know, fire and ice. They don't mix in the words of one of the children says that either 
is I don't think it's Cal. Cal can hardly say words, but maybe Zeth or maybe the other one, the the dot and the daughter too. She's like, you stay behind, buddy. Sorry, you can't come with us. I, how many drachmas do you think is going to happen that Leo's going to end up melting this whole hotel down by mistake? Oh yeah, I mean, right? Like he has fire powers. Everything's made out of ice. He's trying to hide the fact that he has fire powers. Like it's all. It's all coming together, folks. It reminds me of that really god awful scene in the Willy Wonka the Chocolate Factory, the Tim Burton one, where the guy makes that chocolate palace. Oh, and everything melts. Yeah, and everything melts. Yeah. Why would you do that? Yeah. Oh god, I forgot about that scene. That's such a bad movie. Why why not just watch the original movie? It's so much better. Pardon the pun, but they give Leo the cold shoulder. <laughs> that could have also been uh the chapter title, actually. Ooh. Um, oh. a, a, yeah, an icy welcome or the cold shoulder. Either way, both work. Um, they're not happy about him being around. Are we gonna do like ice puns, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in uh, Batman and Robin? Chill out, bird boy. I mean, I guess that's kind of the whole seat. Like that, we find out that Cal and Z f- think that Jason is the original Jason. Um, for a brief time, because they were on his ship, so they have like history. And but then he's not, and they're like, "Oh well, we, we don't, we're not interested in you." And then there's something to the effect of that he's obviously not the Jason of the past, um, but they think he is. And then the the daughter, who again we don't know her name, she says that Boreas is specifically asking for Jason for whatever reason. He knows that they're there. There seems to be there's some interesting things going on because she also seems to know leo's name and says no leo valdez you stay behind and he's like sort of both like how does she know my name i'm a little scared and also has a crush on her so there's a lot of stuff to unpack with that because she's apparently really beautiful i'm both attracted and intimidated at the and exact scared. same time yeah exactly that's kind of his energy that he's bringing this the situation is kind of like breaking off into being like leo has to be off from the group again obviously he's holding festus and their getaway vehicle and now it's going to be Jason and Piper are going to go what see. What does he call Festus again? Like the heaviest carry on or something? Because he's like a little wheelie bag. Yeah, the heaviest carry on item. Because here's the joke. He's like making the jokes about like, oh man, we could go on like a, a plane or something. It's the like carry on only type of stuff. You know, it reminds me a lot of like in Iron Man 2. There's there's the sequence where like Tony Stark has his power suit in a, a briefcase. Like the whole briefcase is his power suit. And that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, like it's it sounds very... Heavy. I mean, well, that's why it has wheels, right? Because he's like, "Ooh, this is a, this is a honker." Um, yeah. I didn't even really occur to me that um, eventually, like Leo's gonna burn everything. But like, obviously, right? Like they're in a hotel of ice, and he can. I mean, I almost said he could breathe flame. Flame. He can't do that, but he could like make fire with his hands. So it's not gonna be good. It's it's gonna be bad. See, the way that I'm looking at it is almost the comedic thing. Like, they all run out of the hotel, and it's like a master shot of the hotel as it just turns to a puddle of water. Like, that's what I'm imagining in my head. Yeah, I mean, like, that's... Again, even though this is the longer chapter, again, not a ton of stuff happens. Like, they just come to the hotel, and there's some, like, tension between all of them. But ultimately, ultimately it's decided that... uh Jason and Piper can go and meet Boreas, and Leo has to stay behind with their dragon. <laughs> and there's not a problem with that because I like that. Hopefully, like later on, because they've even kind of mentioned like these are the first three. Obviously, there's going to be more demigods. Like how how that's going to work with like they're going to have like separate teams, or if if they're going to be more people in that way, or is it going to be from separate perspectives? I mean, I feel like it's probably going to be a little mix, right? Like, sometimes they'll come together and they'll have to work together. That I mean, that's, like, most quests, right? Like, from what we've learned from Percy Jackson. It's like, sometimes they're all together, sometimes they split up. It's It really depends on the circumstances. Sometimes, like, things, they're forced to split up because of whatever reason. Like, in this case, Leo is made to stay behind. Now, in your opinion, B, how much better would have this literary device been in Percy Jackson if you had, like, Percy... Annabeth and then Nico or each each book you add like a new POV person just for a couple chapters I think it it plays to different strengths I think Percy Jackson works the way it works because he's like more of a specific central character and like we focus on his dream sequences and stuff that like sort of reveal a lot 
and we have like that limited perspective here we have like varying limited perspectives where we're trying to like combine all the threads together and i think that works for like this bigger prophecy that involves like supposedly yet more demigods like not just the three of them but there's seven in total so there's like this bigger thing at work and it it makes sense i think for this story but i think percy jackson works fine having just percy yeah i mean like it could have worked from multiple perspectives but like i kind of like that you have that like limited understanding you know what i mean personally for me i think pgo works in the way that it does perfectly i think it's actually one of the most perfectly paced uh books obviously the fourth one it's, it's iffy but everything else is very <laughs> perfectly paced and then you get to this series and i kind of like how the pacing is going a little bit obviously because we're having more multiple characters, the book's going to be longer because you're kind of having to either re-examine things or you're having people going off on these branching paths, which to me seems more realistic. And I like that approach more. Like personally for me, like when I'm reading a book, it's like I like multiple characters because then you get different thoughts and feelings and you might like someone that you think is a jerk face, you get into their headspace and like, oh wait, like, like Leo is a good example that's like, if you didn't have like a POV chapter of Leo, you would absolutely hate that guy. Right. You would just think he was like the comedic relief. Right. And you wouldn't know all the stuff about the fight or whatever because he wouldn't be telling you and it would be like a big reveal later or something. Yeah. It just like it's it's a totally different story that they're trying to tell. I think this is very well suited for like the three prong different perspective, like alternating chapter thing. Like it makes a lot of sense that like there are a lot of themes of like sort of. Uh, disclosure and secrets and like whether or not that they should like tell what the other person like the other person exactly what they know and then sometimes they can't tell and like that I mean that that happens in Percy Jackson too but it's like not quite the same I guess I think it also has to be like the insecurities with like being a teenager you don't want to tell all the truth like mom I got a I got a girlfriend and you don't want to like uh, that she'll oh, my mom will embarrass me so I'm not going to say that I'm going to be hanging out with my friend. One thing I do like, I mean, this is like probably like a like two bullet point reason why I like this series. I mean, I'm not going to say more than PJO because I haven't finished the series. Also, it's like, I don't know. I don't. It's apples and oranges. But I really like this series so far because both we get more, like more of a perspective of like these three characters so we like really get like the inner worlds of different characters that we wouldn't normally like you said like if we didn't get the inner world of leo we would see him totally different you know and maybe if we got the inner world of like grover we would see him totally different too you know what i mean like there's no such thing as a comic relief character in the real world so there really isn't such a thing of that in a story like if they're a well-rounded character they have something else in their life other than being funny or whatever and goofing around well, I think like what makes like a comedic relief character, like uh, like you said before, there aren't really comedic relief characters in the real world because a lot of people use comedy as like a coping mechanism or like a defense. Right. Like there's a reason why you're the comedic relief character. Exactly. And that's why Leo makes sense as a character. And I think that that's like that really like adds a richness to the story because you like you're not surrounded by like these one dimensional characters that like sometimes they're revealed to be more complicated. Selena is a great example, like for like the very the beginning of PJO, you just think that she's like this vapid child of Aphrodite, like, you know, she's one dimensional in the beginning. Like, I hate to say it, but she's like one dimensional throughout the beginning yeah she's one-dimensional she's kind of set dressing right she's just like oh yeah we need a stock character from one of the cabins oh aphrodite that's a perfect cabin because we can make like a very you know sort of like stereotype of like she's flighty and ditzy and she you know only cares about boys or whatever and then later there bec because you've already established that it's like such a plot twist when you find out kind of more multi-dimensional things about her but like from the get-go you get like these three characters that like you see both how they're perceived, right? Like that per Piper is perceived a certain way because of her dad, because she's like now she's t child of Aphrodite. So she's like beautiful. And she there's all these superficial things about her that people treat her that way because of it. And then there's like her inner world and the things that she's lying about and the stuff about her dad and how she wants to save him. Like that. And we would never get that if we didn't have multiple perspectives. That's like what I like about it. Well, especially like going on to that as well as like, when it comes to like having a kid of Aphrodite, like we always have like these like stereotypes, but yet when you get into a person's head and you examine why is it a stereotype, you examine like, oh, wait a second, it isn't. It's just there's misconceptions. Right. Like even if we got into the head of Drew, I bet it would be fascinating, right? Like it's very clear that she has her own stuff going on where she feels jealous that yeah. people go on quests without her, you know, that she, you know, 
That's why she acts out in that way, clearly. The only person that I really wish we had a POV chapter for would have been, like, Bianca. Because that would have been such a fascinating character study. Yeah, that's. I feel like we we hardly know Bianca as a character. I feel the same way. Yeah, I don't know. I. It's just like a different approach to storytelling. But like we can't. We you know obviously. You know Rick Ryden wrote the series that he wanted to write it that way. Yeah, we're kind of like just saying what would work better for us. I think each book is a different type of like you know you can have any type of structure that you want, and it works best. Like we can look at the other ones, but as you know, he builds upon and builds upon. He's also getting better at his craft. Because he wrote those first series like as almost like a whim almost and kind of started building them up. And this is like, okay, I've thought this through. I've planned everything pretty much down to the to the molecule. So we're going to go from there. And I like that about what Rick Ryden does is you can actually see the improvement of his writing a lot with each book. Like he's actually, you know, he gets better with every book, much as like a lot of authors do. Some some don't, but a lot do uh, when it comes to like writing stuff. And I think it's getting to the point of where it's really enjoyable to read multiple characters where it's like, I like this a little more, but then you read Percy Jackson, you can see the merits and why that's good. What's good about that? Yeah. Well, because otherwise you wouldn't have a lot of the tension. So much of the tension in Percy Jackson comes from what we don't know. And so much of the tension in this is what we do know, but the other characters don't know. So like we know information about them, but it's like we have to like deal with the fact that like they're not going to always tell the truth. So we just have to like see the weird interactions. (laughs) Well, I think that actually adds like a really good thing because it adds stakes. Like an example that I would give to this is like, let's just say you're watching a murder mystery and someone has a bomb in the briefcase and you know as the audience that there's a bomb in there, but everyone else doesn't. Like that becomes tension. Like when's the bomb going to go off? Does it go off? Will it go off? Like that type of thing. That's what we're getting here is we're just getting gigantic bombs with like Leo, Jason and Piper. And we're going to see which one goes off first. Is it going to become like a cataclysmic event where they have like the, I, I always call it like the, the buddy buddy thing where like you have like the person like, I thought you were my friend, then they split off and then at the end of the movie they get back together and like we're friends. I guess stepbrothers is the example I would give. Yeah, I mean it's very obvious that because they all have like something they're kind of keeping, even Jason does, um, that it does present an opportunity for them to like, you know, not talk to each other for a while or like have tension and then obviously then they have to like come together right like that's the whole deal is they're a part of this prophecy whether they like it or not they the three of them have to work together maybe that might be the the reason like when festus breaks like they all end up being scattered no pun intended through the winds almost yeah like that I, again there's like a lot of reasons why that that would happen or like in this case like two of them can split off and then leo's left alone which then also gives you the opportunity to see him by himself too which is like another like, that's different as opposed to him, you know, with the two of them. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, I think we're, like, on the same page on this. I think it's actually, like, an interesting thing that Rick Ryden's doing here. So, B, what do you think is going to be happening next chapter? I feel like I'll... Because it's going to be a Jason chapter. Oh, geez. So, next chapter is a Jason chapter. I mean, well, yeah, they're going to meet Boreas. So, we're going to find out why he knows about him. I mean, clearly they know a lot. Like, we're going to find out the name of his daughter, which I... It, that hasn't been revealed to us, right? I keep asking that, but I don't remember them saying. It's, they describe her in detail, right? She has, like, what pale skin and dark hair, and it's like, are they talking about my sister? Um, but then they said brown eyes, and I was like, nope, not her. Just checking. She is not the daughter of the North Wind. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm the daughter of the North Wind. You'd think it would be blue, right? Ice? That would make sense. Um, your your sister quacks in, hey, B, I just got these brown contacts. Let's, uh... Maybe block her ice vision (laughs) so i guess we're gonna find a little bit more about her we're gonna meet boreas find out why the frick frack he knows so much about them why he specifically wants to meet jason um obviously like the original jason had some history with um the boreads or whatever but i don't know if that's connected i don't know exactly what that's gonna entail but if it's a jason chapter i mean obviously he's important he's asked by name to go meet boreas um i don't know why i mean like maybe it's gonna be like interrupted with like (laughs) you know leo doing the dumb thing and setting everything on fire that is a very strong possibility again fire and ice it's a really bad idea um it's like heat miser and snow miser i'm waiting for that easter egg b where they have like that that joke kind of and i'm too much to do do (laughs) do for me like i'm thinking about this like when it comes to boreas i'm thinking about Maybe he's just super air heady because, again, when it comes to the wind, it's supposed to be very unpredictable. Like flighty? Yeah, Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I have no idea what his personality is going to be. That's the interesting thing about gods, right? Like, 
because they all have like their own personalities. They're not infallible the way that you might think of a god as. Um, I mean, just like look at Mr. D, look at all of them. Uh, so I'd be interested to see like what his personality is going to be like, because you kind of never know. Like sometimes they're really benevolent and friendly and other times they're just like real jerks and you kind of and like petulant for no reason. And it like seems to be based on arbitrary things. Um, so it's like, is he calling Jason because he's excited that he's there? Is he calling Jason because he wants to murder Jason? Like there literally is any any thing in between that is possible. I'm imagining because like Jason's the son of Zeus, they're gonna like have like a fist bump moment, or it's kind of like oh how- right, yeah, the whole sky god thing. But again, you you never know, right? Because in PJO, right, uh, Percy meets um, another like wa- like several other water gods, and they seem super PO'd that he's. A child of Poseidon is like, oh, Poseidon. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not always what you think. Well, no, it's like the way that I would look at it is like Boreas being like the regional manager, the assistant to the regional manager. Yeah, exactly. It's like the, it's like, oh, well, I just take care of this wind, but you know, like the the whole sky is your dad's, you know, terrain. Um, ironic, but you know what I mean. Jason, you know what type of wind I have to deal with? Fats. I have to deal with fats all day. That's the wind. Like, there's like. That's the part of the sky that I take care of. Yeah, like, I don't know. Like, he could be bitter about that. I just, I, that's the weird thing about gods is, like, sometimes they have, like, these weird, like, grudges that they hold for, like, thousands of years about a specific god or a specific thing that happened. And, like, I have no idea what is going to happen. Like, they're, are they friendly? Are they going to pretend to be friendly, but they're not actually? I mean, there's, like, Hera, who, like, is ca- supposedly on their side, but is also kind of horrible and hates demigods. So, like, they're... You just like never know how a god's gonna act, basically. So like it's got it's really chaotic. <laughs> All we know is we're gonna maybe find out some stuff about Jason because he supposedly seems to know something. Yeah, no, like there's the grudge between like Annabeth and like Hera. There's like a lot of like those weird things, but you need Hera, and they even like in this chapter kind of examine. Okay, so Leo and I are gonna have to like break some type of cage or something. Like they're already talking about the the prophecy. They're already getting their game plan ready, even though they don't know what it's going to entail. And I think that's. Interesting. I'm excited to see what's going to be happening next chapter. We're doing a Jason chapter. Jason chapters are some of the most, I think, action-y out of all of them, because every time we've had a Jason chapter... Well, yeah, because he's the one with the sword. I mean, Piper has a knife, but it's like a ceremonial, like, shiny knife that's not really for the murdering. And Leo has a dragon now, so I don't know who's got the bigger weapon. Yeah, and the dragon is kind of more transportation, you know? He's kind of more like my horrible Honda Civic, in that, like, you could probably kill someone with him, but, like, for the most part, he gets you from point A to point B, unless he breaks down <laughs> well to be fair b i was really concerned when you hit the button on your honda civic and it turned to a briefcase in front of my eyes and we couldn't figure out how to like yeah put it back out of briefcase mode when we got lost that one time mm-hmm. yeah i feel like that my my car could do that my my car is so old that it came with a cassette player <laughs> well i remember like those the one time i was like hey can i borrow your car like if it breaks down you have to deal with it and i'm like what yeah no well like I, that's what i was saying i was like listen i don't trust it so it's you, it's your own crap shoot that you're really signing up for when you uh ride my car and it's much like festus really it's like well i do appreciate you you do get me from point a to point b most of the time well on that note b where can they find you on social media you can find me on twitter and instagram at b kelly gorman and on tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com if you want to find me on Twitter, you can find me at Suda41, that's S-U-D-A-4-1. If you want to email the show, you can email us at radiocamphaplet at gmail.com. We have a Patreon, Patreon slash radiocamphaplet. We also have t-shirts available at TeePublic, so go to www.tpublic.com. We'd really appreciate that. You can get a sticker with our faces on it. We're working on getting new t-shirts. We'll see how that goes. Well, I'm Zach. I'm B. Let's keep staying mortal, everybody. See ya! Bye, guys.